Fantastic to be here. Um, I heard it's uh, been a very um, interesting session so far, and so I've got a lot to live up for in terms of this session. Uh, tax and accounting on a Friday afternoon. Mmm, <laughs> it's a great start, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. So, look, before I, I, I go any further, I, I thought I'd just play a, a short video clip just to get us going, get us into the mood, and, and hopefully the technology is going to work here. <laughs> Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. <laughs> So, you're going to ask, what's that got to do with this session? Oh, I thought long and hard about that as well, and, and it's got no relevance other than, you know, it's Friday afternoon and we kind of need a little bit of light-hearted stuff to get going before we get into some of the heavy stuff. Um, look, I, I just, just in terms of a little bit of my own background, um, I'm a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers here in Wellington, uh, and I am a tax partner. Um, there is some stuff here on accounting, um, which I will attempt to talk about, but I won't say that I, I'm absolutely right up to speed in terms of all the accounting facets, but I'll try to bring forward at least um, what I kind of see as the, the key kind of issues and things that, that I think is useful at a high level to be aware of. And, and similarly in relation to, to, to tax as well, um, I'm not going to go through section references and all that kind of stuff because even not on a Friday afternoon, unless you're a tax geek like me, you, you're probably just going to fall asleep pretty quickly, so I don't really want that to happen. Uh, but I thought what we'll do is we'll just start off for some comments around uh, what's happening in the current tax environment first you know, what's actually going on out there and just in terms of um, what we're actually seeing, uh, the kind of issues that are arising generally and, and what it actually means for uh, cooperatives and mutuals. Oh, the other thing is if you have any questions, just feel free to, to interrupt me as we go through this. Okay, look, just, just something about the environment, I guess, which is very useful to kind of understand, I, I guess, the inland revenue's view around this and, and of course it's the inland revenue who, whom we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis around uh, uh, clicking on the taxes and ensuring that we're complying with the right things. So, oh, there we go. Much better. Um, so, the, the, the kind of starting point around this is, is that um, we all know uh, New Zealand's position at the moment is, is, is pretty tough. Uh, and so, the government's books are pretty much in a deficit position, and we've got a few more years to go in relation to that. Uh, what that actually means from, from a, an IRD perspective and, and an income tax point of view is is that they, they are pretty keen, obviously, to take every dollar they can. Uh, and, and this kind of leads on a little bit further in terms of uh, what it means for the wider environment. Uh, in, in the budget that's just been released, uh, um, the, there were some winners in relation to, to, to budget spend, and the Inland Revenue was one of those in terms of receiving uh, a small dollop, $78 million, which goes towards uh, their collection, the investigation a unit. So I guess the reason for bringing that up is, is that they are looking to, 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 to spend some money here and, and the um, IR's target in relation to this is that every dollar spent, they expect to receive $6 back. So you can anticipate here, if they're going to spend $78 million, then they're looking to receive in terms of further taxes, not ordinary taxes, but further taxes, more monies back. And so they'll be out there looking for this. Uh, in terms of looking forward, in terms of the future, um, the government said many times over, uh, at least John Key is at least, been on record many times, we know capital gains tax, at least not on his watch. Uh, and so far, no changes in relation to GST, so we're staying at 15%. The issues, of course, of well, and the reasons why I've got that up there is what does that actually mean? We've got a deficit, productivity, GDP, whatever that is, 1.1% I see for the last quarter, bouncing along. Um, how are we actually going to make up that deficit? It's going to be pretty tough. So one of the approaches is we're going to get the investigators out there more to actually turn over and look at more of these, uh, more taxpayers. 
So the last comment there is, is I guess, a bit of a throwaway comment, really, to say that the Inland Revenue and the uh, lawmakers are looking at some pretty minor bottom line things, you know, focusing on taxing paperboys as an example. I mean, that's just crazy stuff. Yes, they are out there. Yes, they earn about, ooh, I don't know, $1,000 a year, if that. The amount of time and effort around trying to tax this is just a bit of a waste of time and a waste of effort. Salary sacrifice arrangements, again, really getting into the really small things and looking to try and find those items and trying to bring them in as tax takes. So, so, so not, 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 not very useful things uh, creating um, some real challenges for us. But what does it actually mean for cooperatives and mutuals? I think it's fair to say that for at least at the smaller end of town, the lending and revenue, particularly around mutuals, does not focus on them very much. They stayed away from them and I'll come to the reasons why they've been doing that. But what I think will happen, based upon the previous slide in terms of the kind of environmental factors that are going on, they're going to be out there more and more and actually looking to broaden their kind of reach and actually asking questions around compliance and managing risk. So that just really gives you a bit of a, bit of a starting point in terms of, from a tax point of view, um, if you haven't had your door knocked on, it may happen coming up. Don't want to be a scaremonger, but those things will, will probably start happening. So what I'm turn to now is just talk a little bit about the taxation status of mutuals and cooperatives. And I, and I, and I focus on mutuals first. And, and what I, as I said, I don't want to talk about a whole lot of section references, but just kind of give you the general kind of approach. Now mutuals, uh, as you all will know anyway, uh, from a tax point of view, the law around that is governed under common law. And so the starting point is, as a mutual, it's a transaction amongst members, you can't make money amongst yourself, so therefore there's no tax to pay. That's your basic starting point. The Income Tax Act comes along and says, hmm, okay, I'm not so sure about that. I do actually want to tax some of these factors. And the ones that it tries to tax is items where there are any services that are being provided. Okay? So generally the only ones that are out are subscriptions. So subscriptions for members, they're mutual, non-taxable, everything else will be taxable. Now, now what does that mean? You kind of think, well, so long as you can identify your income flows, then the key thing there is actually identify what are the tax deductible costs. All right? So once you know what is taxable income, you can then actually work out what your deductions are because they are based upon items which you incur to generate that income. You can show that connection, you can offset that taxable income with deductible costs. So tax is applicable to all business transactions and the tax just like companies. So the tax rate of 28%. And I put from 2011 just to remind myself because I keep on forgetting when it did actually change and, and do kind of worry that um, if there is a change in government that possibly that might go back up again. So as I said, we need to identify the income streams, work out the tax deductions. And the biggest issue that we have around these for organisations of this nature is how to work out what expenditure belongs to which income. So you think about it, any organisations, most organisations, you will have people doing lots of things, collecting subscriptions, writing magazines, uh, looking for advertising in relation to magazines, et cetera, et cetera, actually providing services to members, have some staff doing that. What do you do with your salaries? How do you allocate that apart? What do you do with the rent if you have, a, if you have some premises? Lighting, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so detailed things like that, this is the area in which the concern is, and this is the area if you do have to operate in a mutual kind of arrangement that you need to look out for. The other challenge, though, is that this area of law is very badly understood as far as the Inland Revenue is concerned. And when I say badly understood, it's for a couple of reasons. One is the law is pretty unclear. And two, more recently, in terms of the 2007 Act, um, it has been rewritten a number of times, supposedly to put it into plain, easy to understand language. So that was the plan. However, in the process of doing that, they've actually simplified it so much that if you read the law at the moment, it actually says that you're taxable on all of your income, irrespective of subscriptions or what it is. So they made a bit of a boo-boo in relation to that. They know about it, but at the moment it's not high on their priorities to correct this. The problem is, and I've been in discussions with the revenue officials in relation to this, is that when you have investigators who are in Hamilton or Bongaray or in Dunedin, they get out the legislation and go, hmm, up at the taxpayer and go, 
Oh, why are you apportioning your income and expenditure? It says it's all taxable. And then you get yourself in a real spiral in terms of having a, a discussion, a meeting, an audit, a, a challenge from the revenue. And I guess a water warning around that is that just because the inland revenue says that they don't think you're right, doesn't mean that they're actually right. And actually in this situation here, it has happened quite a few times. So it's a shame, but uh, as I say, the inland revenue do not see that there's a high priority for them because of a lot of other issues going on. Um, they've withdrawn all of the, um, the, their um, the media uh, publications in relation to this, their guidance, but unfortunately they haven't put anything new out. So again, they say if you're involved with these or know someone who's involved with these, just because the revenue comes along and thinks that you aren't doing it right, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually right. That's the key takeaway in relation to mutuals. Cooperatives. They too are taxed as companies from an income tax perspective. And the reason why I keep going, going back to companies is, is because obviously that's the, the normal kind of business model for operating under. So tax rate again, 28% applies the same time from, from 2011 year. And as a company, uh, for most cooperatives will have shares and shareholders. Then the, the, from a dividends point of view, um, you can uh, apply the imputation regime, which means obviously we all be familiar with this. If you receive dividends, the imputation credits attached with those, which means no double taxation to a certain level. Okay, so the cooperative pays tax, fine, generates imputation credits from paying the tax, pay out a dividend, attach the credit. The recipient receives that, has a tax liability, but uses those credits to offset that tax liability. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, if you're on the same tax rate, you're fine. If you're on a lower tax rate, you've got a bit of extra credits. If you're on a higher tax rate, you need to pay some more tax. But at least it ensures there's no double tax going on. There are some special rules, though, that apply that's legislated in the Act in relation to cooperatives. And, and you all probably know about this in terms of the ability to actually pay what we call rebates, rather than just dividends and dividend distributions, which is, is the process which has always been available from an income tax point of view. The rebates themselves, rather than being treated as dividends, they can be elected and treated as basically an expense, like any other kind of expense. So what does it mean? It means that rather than paying a dividend or imputation credits, you can actually pay it out as a rebate, which means there's a tax deduction to the co-op and taxable income to the recipient, which all makes normal kind of sense. If they don't pay tax on it, then it should be still be taxable to, to the other party. There's some, lots of specific criteria which I don't plan to go through here today, uh, but you need to meet those criteria in terms of elections and ensure that the income which you're trying to distribute as a rebate, it also needs to be income that's generated from member transactions. All right? If it's a non-member transaction, then you cannot distribute it by virtue of a rebate. And that starts his mind ticking over and saying, well, so what? What does that mean? It means that from an accounting perspective and from a record keeping perspective, you have to be able to demonstrate where your income sources are coming from if you want to relate for this you need to be able to demonstrate to the revenue that this income came from a member's transactions, this income came from non-member transactions. Because okay? everything on this side can only be distributed by virtue of dividends. Yeah. So it's a good part of that because as I've said down here, um, why have this ability to be able to pay out non-taxed earnings rather than just have a normal company model whereby you just pay tax in the company and pay out dividends. And there's a couple of advantages from that. Um, one, one is that um, the recipient, i.e. the member, may actually want to have non-taxed income. Okay? And we have non-taxed income because that member may actually have a lot of tax deductions from, from interests or, or losses from other, other um, sources and actually reduces their tax liability. If they actually receive the dividend, then they'll have all these surplus credits, which are like, I've got to carry them over the next year and try and use them. So there's a time value of money that goes on there. There's one other advantage, um, which does come with a health warning, unfortunately. But there's one other advantage, which basically says that for the payer, i.e. the cooperative who's paying out the rebate, they get that tax deduction in relation to the income year in which it was relates to. So you're allowed to pay it out during that year or within six months of the end of the year. Whereas the person who's receiving the money 
gets taxed in the year they receive it. So you can see how you can actually get a deferral of when you need to pay the tax. But it just becomes an ongoing one as it moves on. But as I said, there's a health warning in relation to that, uh, and, and, and that is the scary thing around tax avoidance, um, which, which these days is, is right up there in terms of thinking about these. But this is a, a well-trodden path, uh, and generally is happening all the time. So before we go into GST, anyone any questions in relation to, to the income tax side of things? Sort of really zoomed over that, but just really want to touch over those and give you a few highlights on terms of issues. Okay. Okay, GST. Um, as the slide says, um, mutuals and cooperatives aren't afforded any different treatment. Okay? So if you have a business activity, or from a GST technical term, a taxable activity, then GST applies. Yeah? So no different to any other company, partnership, sole trader. If you have some kind of business going on, then GST will apply at the rate of the 15%. So in terms of domestic transactions, you need to be able to carry out all your compliance in relation to recording for those. Uh, financial services, of course, will continue to be exempt. And exports will be zero rated. So normal kind of process. Rebates is an interesting one, though. So rebates is not one of those common things for any of those other entities I talked about. So companies can't pay rebates. You don't have them in a partnership, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the interesting thing about rebates is that from a, an accounting point of view, rebates are paid out just like distributions, just like dividends. Okay, so you work out your accounting profit, and then you decide, okay, I want to distribute some of those profits while it goes out as a dividend or as a rebate, so it's below the line. Whereas ordinarily, a rebate, so not ordinary any expense, well, you'd be above the line as, as an expense item. And when you incur expenses, you try and claim back GST. For the rebates though, because they look like, and, and for other purposes, are, are, are just like distributions, I think there's a real risk here that the GST point of that isn't actually accounted for. Because really, for GST purposes, what's happening here is it's an amendment or treated as a change to the price in which the co-op or the member paid for the goods or services. So an example of that in terms of what normally happens is if you go down in the shop, buy yourself a, a chocolate bar, $2 or whatever it is, $2.30 including GST, 15%, all right, pay that and disappear, and go back and say, well, actually, they got charged the wrong amount, all right? Should have only been $1, so therefore $1.15 including GST. That transaction means there's a reduction in price, all right, and it also means from a GST point of view, a reduction in the amount of GST, which makes sense, right? Because the price has changed. For a rebate, which is coming through as a dividend distribution, quite easily from a compliance point of view and accounting perspective, it can get ignored. When in actual fact, what's happening is the price is changing for a price of goods or services that are being paid or received, then there also needs to be the flow on GST impact as well. And I guess I kind of put it out there to say I'm not sure that is actually that well realised that it's actually going on. And there could be quite a big difference between the member's treatment and the cooperative's treatment. Uh, from a GST point of view, absolutely, yeah. But because of the way the accounting works, it can quite easily be forgotten about. Yeah. Any other thoughts and questions on that? Okay, so um, accounting issues. So I'm going to try and masquerade as an accountant for a little bit now in terms of understanding some of these things and what's actually coming up in the accounting world. So again, um, cooperatives and mutuals treated just like any other entity. Under the New Zealand Financial Reporting Act, uh, entities of a certain nature, size, etc., need to actually comply with international financial reporting standards, um, or IFRS for short. Um, so similar kind of treatment, lots and lots of disclosures if you're a large organisation, which is probably um, the most fun thing to be doing, but, but is it what's required? So absolutely consistent with companies. There are some criteria for some reduced disclosure around differential reporting. So depending upon the size of the organisation, total assets, et cetera, et cetera, then you can reduce your note disclosures. 
All right, but note disclosures are generally the, the biggest kind of thing that take up a lot of time. But in terms of what's actually happening in the marketplace and it's happening in New Zealand is, is, is that the, the MED have been working at and looking at some basis to try and reduce the amount of compliance required in relation to financial statements. Um, because for a lot of organisations it's just way over the top. So they've been um, beavering away in that and they've uh, presented that to, to Cabinet as I understand it. And my expectation, why, my understanding is, is that um, uh, they're actually going to um, put, um, put a bill in front of um, Parliament in the next, next month, hopefully, which is going to suggest amendments to the Financial Reporting Act and Companies Act, etc., and other ones, which will actually mean small organisations will not need to complete financial statements, which will be a fantastic outcome. So no more financial statements in relation to small. Now the question is, what is small? Uh, and um, there are a number of criteria around that. Um, I understand that one of them is something like um, less than $30 million of, of total assets. Um, so so I mean, that's quite a good size, uh, and it will actually reduce a lot of compliance. What it does lead to, though, is questions around, OK, what's going to happen in relation to um, the enforcement from then in review in relation to, to those requirements? And I think the answer will be that um, and actually, right now, there's actually no requirement to submit financial statements to the revenue, except because they've always been there, it's a basis they've been used to, to determine compliance. But what I expect would happen going forward is that you still produce your, your standard using the old term P&L and balance sheet, um, to, to, so that, that I mean, you're going to have to do that anyway, just to, to know um, what's actually going on and, and have good controls around those. But all those note disclosures probably won't be required. Same thing from an auditing perspective. Uh, how, how do you conduct an audit if there are no financial statements? Um, so one would expect that they would still prepare just the basic ones and, and not worry about all of those notes, particularly the ones if, you, if you've seen them around um, derivative instruments, borrowings and all that kind of, they just, and, and you do wonder how much um, value they actually add. So you know that when I, I personally, when I look at them, I, I actually get more confused in terms of what's going on rather than actually get, get more clarity in terms of what the, uh, the entity's up to. So some good things on the horizon, I guess, is, is the takeout point in relation to this slide uh, and hopefully some reduction in compliance costs and therefore businesses can actually work. Well, I think that the detail around exactly audits, reviews and all of those, those things are still coming through. So they're kind of waiting for the first part to be finalised, get the approval in relation to that, and then they're going to consider, OK, what's going to happen next. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't stop any organisation from still doing those as, as perhaps you know, a really good practice. And, and some may just do that anyway. OK, um, those are the main points which I, I really wanted to spin through on, on, a, on a Friday afternoon. Um, happy to take any more questions. So I'll, I'll stay on for a little bit. Um, but uh, if there's no more right now, I'll, I'll get out of your way.